It's not an exaggeration to say that director Wes Craven and writer Kevin Williamson's Scream changed horror when it debuted in 1996. Its general plot is quite simple. A masked, knife-wielding killer is on the loose in the sleepy town of Woodsboro, picking off high schoolers one by one. It's up to Sidney Prescott, played by Neve Campbell, and her friends, as well as Courtney Cox's opportunistic TV reporter Gail Weathers and David Arquette's dopey deputy Dwight Dewey Riley to unmask the killer and survive. Pretty standard stuff. But what set Scream apart at a time when the slasher was passé was its metafictional aspect. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back! <laughs> its characters live in a world very much like the real one, watching horror movies and being well aware of their tropes and cliches, only to find themselves targeted by a killer who's also obsessed with horror. Name the killer in Friday the 13th. <laughs> Sorry, that's the wrong answer. By its nature, Scream is a horror movie about horror movies, and specifically about the public's reaction to slashers. But by taking inspiration from the original Halloween suburban horrors and pushing further into societal dynamics, Scream also becomes a story about our own relationship to violence, and the privileged position many take when disconnecting from, and vicariously enjoying, violence suffered by others. The legacy of Scream is the new wave of meta-commentary within horror that re-energized the genre, and also led to many, many films that tried to be Scream and failed. And that meta-nature has been covered in great detail detail across the decades. So what we're going to do is avoid the meta aspects of Scream, and instead draw focus to its commentary on the media's growing obsession with grisly murder during the 90s, its critiques of societal privilege highlighted by its killers, and how we view Scream a quarter of a century later. In the process, we may find Scream to have a sharper edge than the blade of its killer. There are two sides to the murder spree happening in Scream. There are the people directly affected by the killings, Sydney being the most endangered and most emotionally tormented of the bunch. And there are the people who watch with a sort of gleeful sadism. The most meta elements of that sadism are seen in those like Randy Meeks, who stands in for us as the audience, knowing everything about horror movies and observing the cliches the killer partakes in. Everybody's a suspect! And what else are we here for but to enjoy a horror movie for its grisly thrills? But there's another side to the voyeurism of Scream, which is found in Gail Weathers, who just can't help but shove herself into the ongoing spree happening in Woodsboro. It isn't long into Scream until we find Weathers and her crew swooping in to get the story and grab some fame, quickly finding out that Weathers also wrote a book sensationalizing the murder of Sydney's mother a year prior. I'll send you a copy. <coughs> Beyond Scream's ongoing commentary on horror movies, which allow us to indulge in vicarious thrills without anyone actually being harmed, Craven and Williamson's film comments on the media's obsession with real-life tragedy, providing those same thrills but at the cost of actual lives. It's ironic given Scream's script being inspired by the Gainesville Ripper serial killer. I was watching this Barbara Walters special on the Gainesville murders, said Williamson. I was being scared out of my mind. During the commercial break, I heard a noise, and I had to search the house. And I went into the living room and a window was open. And I'd been in this house for two days. I'd never noticed the window open. So I got really scared. So I went to the kitchen, got a butcher knife, got the mobile phone. The Ripper killed at least five students from 1989 to 1990, and while there aren't any real similarities between the real-life killer and Ghostface, it was enough to get Williamson locked into his central premise. Within the film, Gail and her crew hound every potential victim and crime scene, but are completely disconnected from both the horror of it all and their own potential danger. Disconnected until they are finally targeted. Even then, Scream uses the disconnect TV screens create to kill, with Gale's cameraman so engrossed with watching his secret live feed of a house that he forgets it's on a 30 second delay. <laughs> Plenty of Scream can be played for comedy, and some of this acting is unintentionally hilarious. I'll send you a copy. Bam! Sid! Super bitch! But Craven doesn't wink at the audience. Instead, he plays it straight, even when the film is shouting its references in our face. Scream is scary because there's something there hiding beneath all the winks and nods to the genre. Something that feels a little too close to home. And in the years after Scream debuted, that fear would become even more real. Hello? What the hell, dude? 
but I've been trying to get you to pick up the phone for five minutes. Sorry, Laron Reedus from Reedus 101. I've been kind of busy talking about how Scream is more than just meta references. Yeah, I know. I was trying to catch you before you finished. There's a whole lot more it becomes an allegory for outside of what you're going to cover. Really? Like what? Oh, you know good and damn well what I'm talking about. Oh. Oh. Beyond its ongoing commentary regarding the horror genre, Scream sets itself apart by featuring a very human and quite possibly inept killer. Who is this ghost-faced psychopath? Well, we need to get into spoilers. But you should probably already know what happens in Scream nearly 25 years later. What's your favorite scary movie? Scream opens with a terrifying, brutal, and fairly grounded killing, shocking audiences by killing off Drew Barrymore's Casey, at the time the biggest star in the cast. It's subversive and shocking, almost homaging Hitchcock's Psycho by killing off what would seem like its star before anyone would expect. But it also makes Scream start off on a far more serious note than you might expect for a film most renowned for its meta aspects. And Scream is still a lot of fun. It's just that seeing a teenage girl plead for her life, having her parents hear her dying breaths, and then find her hanging corpse is a bummer. The Ghostface Killer, insert Ghostface Killer reference here, wreaks absolute carnage. It's just a matter of the killer actually catching who he's after. Let's count the number of times our slasher falls over something or gets hit. <laughs> Man, it must be hard to see in that mask. So while we don't see who is under that dime store cloak and Edvard Munch-like mask for a while, we know there's nothing supernatural going on here. The big twist in Scream is that Ghostface is not one, but two people, Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, explaining how this clearly human killer is able to be around every corner like the inhuman slashers of old. What's hilarious about Scream is that the film basically tells you that Billy is the killer right from the start. I mean, this guy is a total creep, sees everything in life as if it's a movie, and is named as the prime suspect nearly right away. Even horror nerd Randy tells us that Billy is the killer at one point, and Randy is the one person most aware of the story they're in. Are you telling me that's not a killer? There are just enough swerves to keep it in doubt. But when you know the twist, the answer's basically been there all along. And Stu? He's so into the deaths that he might as well just put on the mask right then and there. Casey and Steve were completely hollowed out. And the fact is it takes a man to do something like that. What we see and why these boys start killing and how everyone reacts to the wave of murders is a different kind of horror. A horror of being privileged enough in your everyday life that becoming a serial killer seems no different than what you've seen play out on screen hundreds of times. Of being privileged enough that when your fellow classmates are carved up, it actually kind of rules because you get to skip school. Billy may have a slight, if still completely irrational, motivation for his killing spree, but Stu absolutely doesn't. And for all their seeming craziness, Billy and Stu's spree took time, effort, and lots of planning. The sort of freedom you get from suburban malaise, absentee parents, and plenty of money. Most of all, it took a general lack of care for human life. What makes anyone go on a killing spree or start shooting people? There's never anything that could be described as understandable. Reasonable people don't do that. Scream manages to take the realistically disturbing horror at the center of the slasher genre that had been lost for years, make it once again frightening, and give it a slick meta vibe that makes it easier to swallow. Because in the end, Scream is really about how the scariest thing in the world may be white boys with too much time on their hands. He's sick for fucks, you've seen one too many movies. Now Sid, don't you blame the movies! Movies don't create psychos, movies make psychos for creators! Speaking of which, what could say white privilege more than throwing a kegger to celebrate a killer being on the loose in your neighborhood? It's not just the killers that show a general lack of human decency. Randy and his friends are more interested in the horror movies the killings remind them of than the people being literally gutted all around them. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. 
Yes, Scream is a horror movie aware of horror movies, but these aren't characters who actually think they're in a movie. And when the group finds out their principal was killed and strung up from their school's goalpost, they run off to see it. <laughs> Basically, everyone in the movie besides Sydney and Dewey react to the killings with either casual dismissal or a gruesome interest. The video store sees a boom in their horror rentals. Principal Fonzie kind of likes the idea of his students getting carved up like turkeys. Students run through the halls dressed up like Ghostface for a prank. Tatum walks right up to her killer, unable to believe she would actually be in danger. A serial killer on the loose is like Halloween come early for Woodsboro. Compare how the white suburban residents of Scream react to a killer on the loose to how the multi-rational characters of Spike Lee's Summer of Sam are impacted by the real life Son of Sam in the Bronx, and the societal critique becomes even more apparent. One group parties, the other has their lives torn apart. While there are meta aspects threaded throughout Scream, these elements really only come to the forefront in the film's final act, as the killers try to live out their horror movie fantasy. But once again, Billy and Stu are quite human and, in the end, not all that good at their job. My mom and dad are Sydney escaping and killing Billy and Stu is the defeat of the final girl trope by not fitting into it and still winning, as well as the assertion that life is a lot more complicated, messy, and painful than any horror film could ever be. <laughs> Scream isn't necessarily trying to make huge points about suburban society, but the ways in which its characters easily roll along with any sort of violence that doesn't directly affect them, and how we can easily buy into such reactions, becomes a natural critique of how modern society has easily become accustomed to tragedies. Scream's meta-commentary is only one of the many different elements within Craven's film. And by its nature of being a film that is constantly commenting on its specific frame of reference of white suburbia in the mid-90s, that reference inherently looks different as time goes by. It's difficult to look at Scream nearly 25 years later and not see it through the lens of everything that's happened between then and now, both in the horror genre and the real world. Horror itself seemed to reform around Scream in the wake of its incredibly successful debut. The slasher subgenre, which had its boom and bust in the 80s, was back and more self-aware than ever. Williamson's self-aware fingerprints were everywhere, and what seemed so fresh at Scream's debut became run-of-the-mill pretty quickly. So Williamson moved on to TV, making shows like Dawson's Creek, which is basically Scream without the stabbing. Oh god, he did have the caucasity to create Dawson's Creek, didn't he? Sure did. Ugh. But the Scream-style slasher genre that fixated so heavily on high school violence changed in the wake of the Columbine shooting in 1999, which was, at the time, the deadliest school shooting in US history. There's always a level of disconnect between reality and horror, something that allows us to be scared of what we're seeing on screen, but to also walk away from when the movie's over. That's the appeal of horror after all. It's a dry run for real life tragedy, a chance to scream our lungs out and experience the rush of terror without the actual impact of seeing loved ones die. But what happens when the tragedy on screen starts to become too close to what's happening in our actual lives? Much like the media's obsession with the killings happening within Scream itself, news coverage of Columbine was everywhere. People were obsessed with the idea that violent video games and movies caused the shooting. Horror came under new scrutiny and the slasher boom went bust again. Of course, there was never any real reason for what happened at Columbine, even though the two killers that did it planned their attack for a year. And much like the teenagers who party while their friends die in the film, we slowly became desensitized to mass murder in the United States. Does that mean we can't enjoy Scream given how much things have changed since its debut? Of course not. No matter how much things have evolved, Scream is still a highly effective horror film. It's thrilling when it wants to be and funny when it should be. <laughs> Great horror films tap into the fears of their time, highlighting them and letting audiences indulge in something they're either consciously or subconsciously terrified of in real life. 
how we choose to deal with those fears and the ways they continue to play out in the real world are beyond even the most well-intentioned of creators. Said Craven, I make movies about fear and terror. People say, why would anybody want to be scared? I say, they pay money because they are scared and they want it to be exercised. Almost 25 years later, the scariest parts of Craven and Williamson's film may be scarier than ever. Of course, the Scream series itself has never really died. Craven and Williamson went on to immediately make Part 2 the next year and Part 3 in 2000, building off of Williamson's brief outlines that were sold with the original draft, in a series of films that could be generously described as shoving itself further and further up its own ass. Now you laugh, but in doing so, Craven and Williamson accidentally gave everyone who was properly paying attention to the series a very valuable lesson. How to construct a trilogy. Hi everyone and thanks for watching today's video. First and foremost, I want to give a big shout out and thanks to Laron Reedus from Reedus101 for guesting and really being the impetus behind this whole video. It probably would have been a lot longer until I finally covered Scream if it wasn't for Laron coming to me and asking me to partner with him on this video and on his own video. So make sure to subscribe to Laron's channel. I'll make sure to have the link in the description below. And make sure to look out for part 2 in this series which covers the Scream trilogy as a whole. It's gonna be great. Once again, thank you to all my patrons for continuing to support the channel. I'll be back again soon with another video. I hope that you're all doing well, staying safe, and taking care of each other. See you soon.